We've been using conservation of energy, and for conservation of energy to be true, the total energy won't change, but that's only when there's conservative internal forces. Conservative forces being forces like gravity or spring force. And nothing is coming from outside and adding energy to our system. So what happens if we add a non-conservative external force? So what does that mean? A non-conservative force would be something like friction. That's a case where we're going to lose the energy, uh, or the energy is going to exit the system through heat, air resistance, or also an outside force. That would be an external force. So if we have a box that is sliding along the ground and someone comes in and pushes it with their hand, that's a new force coming into the system, an external force. So when the non-conservative external forces are added, we're going to have a change in our energy. It's not going to be conserved anymore. So these are going to be cases where work is done. Work will be done on the object and the total mechanical energy will change. So for something like a person pushing a box forward, that's going to be a positive work and energy will be added to the system. Some, for something like friction or air resistance, they go opposite the motion or displacement of the object. So that's going to be negative work. Negative work will mean that energy is taken away from the system. So let's do a conceptual example. Let's say Fred hits a tennis ball with a racket. The racket applies a force to the ball, which is then moved to the right. First, is work done? Well, we have a force, we have a displacement. They're in the same direction, so yes, work will be done. Is there a change in energy? From the beginning, when the ball was um, just in his hand, to when he hit it and it's moving horizontally, there is a change in energy. We have an increase in kinetic energy. And let's say its potential energy uh, is about the same, or it may decrease and then an increase in kinetic energy in that direction also. But um, for the overall system, there is an increase in kinetic energy when he hits it with the tennis racket. Is this positive work? Yes, the ball is gaining energy, and um, the ball will be not be slowing down, but it will be uh, speeding up, so it's going to be positive work too. So what does this look like in terms of math? Well, the work energy theorem, this is a fundamental concept for physics. It says that work is equal to the change in energy of the system. So we've used this equation. Uh, we've talked a lot about how work equals force times distance and for FD cosine theta, and we've kind of ignored this part. But this is the fundamental idea behind the work energy theorem. It says the work done um, is equal to the change in energy of the system. So this is going to go into our conservation of energy equation. So we started with, we used to have this kinet initial energy, uh, conditional kinetic energy plus initial potential energy equals final kinetic energy plus final potential energy. Now we're adding work to the system. The energy is not going to be conserved anymore. This work that we add on the left hand side, the work done on the system is going to either add or remove energy from the system. So what we have, um, this total is not going to equal this total because now we've added something new on the left hand side. So our equations are still going to be 1 half mv squared for kinetic energy and mgy for potential energy and now we're adding in fd cosine theta for our work done. That might be positive or negative depends on what type of work is done to the system. So let's do an example. Francine's 1,000 kilogram car is traveling with a speed of 25 meters per second and it skids to a stop. The car experiences an 8,000 newton force of friction. Determine the stopping distance of the car. So we're going to look at the change in energy from when she starts to when she stops and the work that's done and how that's going to, uh, how we can calculate the distance. So we start with her initial condition. Her initial condition, she has zero potential energy because she's at the height of zero. Her kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So you plug in the values that are given to you and you get her initial kinetic energy is 312,500 joules. And at the end, her potential energy is zero. She's still at height zero. 
and she com is coming to a stop. So her final kinetic energy is zero joules. So from these two numbers, you can see that energy is not conserved. But we're going to use um, the work added to the system to see how far she traveled. So the work done on the system is the force times the distance times the cosine of 180. So that is a uh, force of 8,000 newtons. The distance is what we're trying to find. And we know that the angle is 180 because the friction is going against the displacement. So we're going to use the equation our total initial mechanical energy plus the work equals our total final mechanical energy. And we've already calculated potential and kinetic initially and potential and kinetic final. We set up the equation. This is our initial energy plus the work done equals our final energy. And solve for D, we get to 39.1 meters. Now we're going to talk about power. Power is related to work done. Um, let's say that Fred's car also slows to a stop, but it happens twice as quickly. So does this change the work that was done? Think about how work depends on the force and the distance, but it does not depend on time. So just by stopping more quickly, it doesn't mean that he did any more work. What he did does have is more power, and power is the rate at which we do work because power takes into account the time. So the equation on your equation sheet for power is change in energy over the change in time. And remember, change in energy, according to the work energy theorem, is equal to the work. So if you see this equation on your equation sheet and you also have this equation on your equation sheet, you can conclude that power is equal to the work done per unit time, or work over delta T. So the units we use for power are watts, and one watt is equal to one joule per second. Power is also measured in horsepower, not as often, but sometimes. And a horsepower, you don't need to learn this, but it's about 750 watts. So let's do an example. We have two phys physics students, Will and Endable, and Ben Pump and Iron are in the weightlifting room. Will lifts the 100-pound barbell over his head 10 times in one minute. Ben lifts the 100 pound barbell over his head 10 times in 10 seconds. Which student does the most work? They do the same work. Work only depends on force and distance. They have the same force applied over the same distance, assuming they're the same height. Um, they're doing the same work. Which student delivers the most power? Well, Ben delivers the most power. He does the same work in less time, and power is work divided by time. So as time gets smaller, power will get bigger. So Ben has more power.